Thank you all for being here. Um, for the latest in the Harlan Institute's author series, um, a luncheon event here with, uh, with our guest John C. Goodman of the Independent Institute and National Center for Policy Analysis, talk about his uh, important health care reform book, Priceless. Um, I see some new, new, some new faces here. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jim Lakely. I'm the Director of Communications at the Heartland Institute. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to tell those of you who are new um, a little bit more about the Heartland Institute. We're a 28-year-old national nonprofit research and educational organization. We're a think tank like the Heritage Foundation, Cato, Cato Institute, the Brooks Institution, and the organizations that uh, John Goodman works for as well. Our mission is to discover, develop, and promote free market solutions to economic problems and social problems. We're different from other think tanks in that we don't just produce white papers and books and give speeches and testimony and hold events such as this one. Um, we also produce public policy newspapers, 20-page uh, tabloid-sized publications, and we send all national and state elected officials. Uh, the titles of those are Budget and Tax News, Environment and Climate News, Finance, Insurance, Real Estate News, uh, Healthcare News, Infotech and Telecom News, and School Reform News. And no other think tank does this. Uh, our research shows that it's been very effective in educating state legislators about the importance of economic and individual liberty and the restraint of government uh, power. And you can see all the stories that they develop on our website, on our news website called The Heartlander, news.heartland.org. And before I bring John on, we actually have a lot of events coming up I wanted to alert you to, um, which you can find out about at heartland.org slash events. Uh, this Thursday, July 19th, uh, Heartland is co-sponsoring with the Illinois Policy Institute a cocktail hour presentation by British economist John Blundell. We'll be talking about <coughs> ladies and liberty, how women have played an intrinsic role in the movement for liberty and his friendship with Lady Thatcher. That begins at 5.30 p.m. on the 40th floor of IPI's office building at 190 South LaSalle Street. On the next day, on Friday, July 20th, right here in this room, Larry Gould, who presented at our 7th International Conference on Climate Change in May, uh, is back in town. He'll be presenting a talk titled Climate Alarmism, Ferreting Out False Method, Surfing Sounds of Silence. Gould is a professor of physics at the University of Hartford and a past chair of the New England section of the American Physical Society. Um, if you are at all interested in climate policy, and learning the truth about what's happening to our planet, uh, I highly recommend you join us on Friday. This is a luncheon event that starts at 11.30, just like this one, and you can uh, sign up to come on our website, or you can give us a call at 312-377-4000. On Monday, July 30th, Dr. S. Fred Singer, another person who presented at our 7th International Conference on Climate Change, is going to be here in this office uh, to give a talk on environmental science. Um, he is really the godfather of climate skepticism around the world, uh, probably the most highly respected uh, contrarian uh, scientist as far as global warming is concerned. Um, and it's a real treat to have him here to speak with us uh, on Monday, July 30th. Again, that's going to be a luncheon event just like this one, <coughs> starting at 11.30. And finally, uh, there's a big day for the Harlan Institute on August 9th with two very special events. Uh, starting in the morning is our seventh uh, Emerging Issues Forum, which is a, uh, a day-long policy forum with which elected officials, policy analysts, uh, and government affairs professionals, including most of the staffers here at the Heartland Institute, uh, will be talking about free market ideas and exploring solutions to the top public policy issues facing the states. It's a unique, um, again, a unique event that the Heartland Institute does that other uh, to outreach to state legislators and other think tanks don't really do as well. And then that evening is the highlight of our year, our annual benefit dinner, which is taking place at the Navy Pier and featuring uh, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, the bane of public sector unions, and the most successful and probably popular conservative governor in the country right now. Uh, you may have heard ads about this event on WIND, and I certainly hope you have. Um, and we expect uh, 700, more, 700 or more people to be there, maybe our biggest event ever. And we really hope you can be there to, to celebrate um, freedom with us and with Governor Walker. And again, you can find more information about that on our website at heartland.org. Um, and also, I want to thank the staff here before I introduce John. Um, we put on events like this quite often. Um, they go on very smoothly because of the great work of people like Nikki Comerford and Keely Dracala and, uh, and other people on our staff, so I want to thank them for that. And again, all of the stuff that we do here is not possible without the generous donations of a lot of people in this room. Uh, so if you've given to us, we want to thank you for that. If you can give a little bit more, we want to encourage that. So um, thank you for that. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest of honor, John C. Goodman. He's a longtime friend of the Heartland Institute, and he's a research fellow at the Independent Institute, president and Kelly Wright Fellow in Healthcare at the National Center for Policy Analysis, 
and the author of the widely acclaimed new book, Priceless, Curing the Healthcare Crisis, which is on sale today, and we have a copy in your possession right now. The Wall Street Journal and the National Journal, among other media, have called him the father of health savings accounts. And Heartland's own Peter Ferrara, who reviewed Dr. Goodman's book in the American Spectator last month, said, quote, Priceless offers the prospect of a worldwide revolution in healthcare policy. We should hope so. And here to explain that exciting prospect in more detail, it's my honor to introduce John C. Goodman. Thank you, Jim, for that very kind introduction. Can you all um, hear me in the back? Yes. Is my sound on? <clears throat> I thought my office was being a little bit generous when we suggested some of those remarks to Jim, but I enjoyed hearing every word of it. <laughs> now, if you Google John Goodman's health policy blog, you're going to discover two things. Uh, first, you're going to discover that this is the only health policy blog that approaches health care from an economic point of view. And all the principal bloggers at our site believe that the reason for our problems in health care, cost, quality, and access, are that people face perverse economic incentives. And when they act on those incentives, they make costs higher, quality lower, access more difficult than otherwise would have been the case. And that if we want to solve these problems, we've got to get the economic incentives right. Um, People from across the political spectrum come and comment at the blog, but the bloggers themselves all are committed to those ideas. The other thing you're going to discover is that uh, this is the only health policy blog of any persuasion whatsoever that has a sense of humor. Um, we feel like if we can't make you smile at least once a day, we're not really doing our job. And uh, I don't know what it is about the field I'm in, but it's just dominated by a bunch of sourpusses. And not only do they not have a sense of humor, but often they don't know when I'm joking. People like Paul Krugman, for example, from the New York Times. I've gotten in trouble with him a couple of times because he, he doesn't know when we're being satirical. So we created this, this yellow uh, yield sign, which is uh, a, a, you know, a satire alert for the humor challenge, so people like Krugman would uh, <laughs> know uh, not to take something entirely seriously. Uh, we do things like, uh, we had a post the other day on how Obamacare is going to push you into HMOs and how they're going to ration your care, and underneath it we had Aretha Franklin singing, Say a Little Prayer for You. <laughs> and then we had a post the other day on end of life care, and we had Bob Dylan singing, Knocking on Heaven's Door. Uh, we had um, um, uh, this fat, I'm going to take off my coat and it's a little more. We had a fascinating uh, uh, back and forth the other day with the insurance guys and the doctors, and they went back and forth for about 50 or 60 comments. And finally, this doctor said, you know, you insurance guys are killing our patients. And uh, I thought that was so fascinating. I reposted some of those comments at the blog, and underneath that one, I had Leslie Gore singing, you'd cry too if it happened to you. <laughs> Once in a while, we're accused of being insensitive and irreverent. Probably the worst thing I did happened about two years ago. Uh, a gentleman walked into the, hos the Parkland Hospital emergency room in Dallas, and he waited 19 hours and died before he ever saw a doctor. And we thought this was a tragedy and it could have easily have happened in Chicago or other cities, and so we posted something about it. But underneath it, we had Lionel Richie singing all night long. That probably wasn't the one since. Did you ever think about doing billboards? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, I usually have a cell phone with me when I speak because you never know when you're going to have an emergency. Um, but seriously, um, did you know that in America there are more cell phones than there are people? Uh, even the panhandler out on the street corner probably has a cell phone, but he probably also has difficulty obtaining access to health care. If something goes wrong with my cell phone, there are a dozen places in Dallas that are near where I live. Uh, I can go in without an appointment, I get quick service, uh, high quality service, inexpensive service. There are shops in Dallas that will send someone to my home to repair my cell phone. Uh, there's a national chain called Eye Hospital. Its employees are called Eye Doctors. But if something happens to my body, uh, did you know that the average wait in the United States for a patient to see a new doctor is one week? And in Boston, where we're told they have universal coverage, the average wait is two months. Did you know that one out of every five people who goes to a hospital emergency room leaves without ever seeing a doctor because they just get tired of waiting? So my question to you is why is the market so kind to my iPhone and so mean to my body? 
And I would argue the reason is because this iPhone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market with real prices. And in healthcare, we have systematically, for decade after decade, suppressed the price system. So much so that no one ever sees a real price for anything in healthcare. No patient, no doctor, no employee, no employer. The biggest mistake we have made in healthcare is to believe that the way you make healthcare accessible is to make it free at the point of delivery. And what we've overlooked in doing that is that when you completely suppress the price system, you cause people to pay for health care in other ways. And basically, in the United States, we mainly pay for health care with time and not with money. We pay for health care the same way the Canadians pay for it, or the British, or people all over continental Europe. And the problem there is that as the price pushes down and becomes less and less important, all these non-market barriers to care become increasingly important. What do I mean by non-market barrier to care? I mean, how long does it take you to get someone on the telephone to give you an appointment at a doctor's office? How many days does it take before you get to see that doctor? How long does it take you to get from your home to the doctor's office? And once you get there, how long do you have to wait before you actually see the doctor? Those are all non-price barriers to care. And there's lots and lots of evidence that those non-price barriers to care are a, more of a deterrent than the price that the doctor actually charges. There was a fascinating study last year by the Center for Health Systems Change. And one of the things they observed was that even though we're in the worst economic crisis now since the Great Depression, unmet health care needs are actually down. That means that there are fewer people telling pollsters they have an unmet health care need than before the recession began. And so the first question was, well, why is that the case? And the researchers concluded that's the case because people with insurance in these difficult economic times are becoming more careful and more prudent in their shopping for health care. They're putting off uh, uh, items of, of marginal value to them. And as they do that, they're freeing up resources for the uninsured. So how exactly is that happening? Well, nothing's been happening to the price of health care. Because throughout this recession, prices for health care haven't changed at all. What's been happening is these non-price barriers to care have been coming down. Okay? The, how long does it take to get the doctor's office? How long does it take to uh, get the doctor on the phone? All of those barriers are coming down, and they have had a significant impact on access to care for the uninsured. Another study um, uh, looked at North Carolina Medicaid program. The state was having difficulty uh, with its budget. It was allowing Medicaid recipients to buy a 90-day supply of pills for only $1. And so to cut costs, the state said, well, in the future, it's not going to cost $1. It's going to cost $3. And furthermore, we're not going to give you a 90-day supply on one visit to the pharmacist. You're going to have to come every 30 days. So what the state actually did in economic terms is it tripled the money price of care, and it tripled the time price of care. And the really fascinating discovery was that that tripling of the time price of care made a bigger difference in deterring access to pills than the tripling of the money price. So even for poor people on Medicaid, uh, the non-price barriers are the bigger barriers. One more study I think is really interesting. This was of the CHIP program, which you can think of as Medicaid for children. And in this program, uh, the researchers discovered that just enrolling children in CHIP does not increase access to care. Because they don't make more doctor visits. They don't get to see the doctor more frequently. But the one thing that does increase access to care is paying the doctor more. If you pay the doctor a higher fee, then it becomes easier to see that doctor. Um, now think about that for a moment. Here we're encouraging parents to enroll their children in this free public program. And many of them drop their private insurance in order to take advantage of this. <coughs> The private insurance allowed them to see just about any doctor they wanted to in the area where they live. They get in a chip and they find there are a few doctors who want to see them, but we make it illegal for them to add to chip's payment rate and pay the market price so that they can have greater access to care. In this country, there are about 50 million people on the food stamp program. Um, these people can walk into any supermarket that you and I go into. They can buy any product we buy. They, say they pay the same price as we buy. When they reach the supermarket stand, they put down their food stamps, they put money on top of the food stamps, and they walk out of the door. You never, ever hear it said that there's a problem with access to supermarkets for poor people, right? Contrast that with the Medicaid program, where there are another 50 million people, basically the same people, who are on Medicaid. 
And what is the biggest problem that people on Medicaid have? <coughs> Their biggest problem is finding a doctor who will see them, right? Um, I was uh, in Boston about a year ago, and I was in a cab, and I was talking to a woman cab driver. And as I frequently do, I ask how the healthcare system is working there, Romney care, as we tend to call it. And she said, well, it's, I guess it's okay, but she says, I'm having a real hard time finding doctors who will see me. And I said, well, tell me about that. She said, well, I had to go down a list of 20 names before I could find a doctor who would see me. And I said, well, are you going down the yellow pages? And she said, no, I was going down the list that Medicaid gave me. Okay. Now, in this country, there are about a thousand walk-in clinics. They're in many clinics. They're in Walmart. The ones in the CVS, I'm sorry, they're in CVS Pharmacy and Walmart, and the ones in CVS Pharmacy are called Minute Clinics. And as that name implies, the Minute Clinic <coughs> chain knows that your time is valuable as well as your, as, as well as your money. And so what they're advertising is quick service, but it's also high quality service. Uh, the studies show that in these clinics, the nurses following computerized protocols uh, deliver more consistent care than traditional uh, doctors, primary care doctors do. So you have high quality care, it's for a low price. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, at the Menin Clinic, they would charge about $75 for sore throat or earache. Um, but the Medicaid price for those kinds of treatments is only half of what Menin Clinic charges, so the Menin Clinic won't accept the Medicaid patients. Now we could vastly increase access to care for low-income people in this country if we simply allow them to access health care the way they buy food. In other words, if they could take the Medicaid rate and add money out of their own pocket on top of that, uh, we wouldn't really have a problem of access to health care for low-income people in this country. But because we don't do that, they're forced to go to community health centers and to places like Parkland Hospital in Dallas, which is where you'd want to go if somebody shot you with a shotgun in the stomach, but not where you want to go for your primary care because the average wait is not 19 hours, that was a special case, but the average wait is about four, five, or six hours depending upon the day of the week. And that's where a lot of people are getting their primary care these days. And as I've already said, one out of five don't even wait for the care they, they leave before they get it. Um, so if we want to begin to solve our problems in this country, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to free the patient. <coughs> the second thing we've got to do is we've got to free the doctors. Doctors are the only professionals in our society who are not free to repackage and reprice their services to the market. Every other professional, the lawyers, the accountants, the architects, engineers, can change what they offer and can change what they charge when demand changes, technology changes, or any other market parameters change. Doctors are not free to do that. Doctors are slaves to a third-party payment system. And it basically starts with Medicare, and most private payers pay the same way that Medicare pays. And by that I mean Blue Cross, the employer plans, and, and the other private insurers. Um, back to the cell phone for a moment. Um, you know, it was almost a century ago when all the other professionals discovered that this is a handy device for talking to clients. Right? I had a legal problem this spring, and I had a lawyer who talked to me, sometimes face to face, sometimes by phone, sometimes by email. We did it whatever was the most efficient way at the time, and of course she's billing by time, so it really doesn't matter how we communicate. Um, but doctors don't do that. Um, it's real hard to get a doctor to talk to you on the phone, especially to give you a consultation. And why do you think that is? Don't get paid. Who said they don't get paid? All right. Uh, Medicare has a list of about 7,500 tasks that it pays doctors to do. And it just so happens that the telephone is not really on that list, or it's not on the list in a way that's practical. And so Medicare doesn't pay doctors to talk to you on the phone, and the private payers pay the same way Medicare pays, so they're not paying the doctor to do that either. Now, if you're a doctor in this day and age, the third-party payers are pushing down on you and squeezing your payment rates. You don't have time, uh, or you can't afford, to spend non-billable hours on, on non-billable activities. And so, um, so that's why they're avoiding the telephone. Now we get to the end of the 20th century and all the other professionals have discovered email. Everybody's emailing everybody these days, right? Even the corner liquor store emails me. I have a wine, they know I like. Um, but my doctor's not emailing me. I don't get an email saying, now it's time for your flu shot or come in and do this or that. Why is my doctor not emailing me? 
You were so good last time. <laughs> Easy pop quiz. You just repeat this answer and you're going to be plus on this exam. Um, um, down the list of 7,500 things that Medicare pays for, it turns out that email is not on there either. It's not on the way, or at least it's not on there in a way that's uh, convenient and practical for the doctors. I'll give you one more example. Um, you go to a doctor and he prescribes a, a drug for you, but he doesn't know what it costs. Or if he does, does know what it costs, he doesn't know if there's a therapeutic or, su or, or um, generic substitute for that drug. Or if he knows about the substitutes, he doesn't know what they cost. Or if he kind of knows what these things cost, he doesn't know where you can go in your neighborhood to get the best price on your drug. Now, if you stop to think about it, who in the marketplace would be the best person to know these things? It would be the doctor, right? But I've done this at the NCPA, or my colleagues have done it, and I know how time-consuming it can be to try to find out what the prices are in the different places. It's not something you don't just hit a button and find out these things. And here again is another thing that Medicare doesn't pay doctors to do, so the private payers aren't paying either. Um, well, I'll give you one more example. Um, a mother takes her diabetic child to the emergency room of a hospital, and there's a problem. The doctors deal with the problem. If they would just spend 30 more minutes with the mother, they could teach her how to manage the diabetes in the home. Same thing for asthma, same thing for a lot of other chronic conditions. But unfortunately, Medicare doesn't pay for patient education. And so a cheap, efficient way of managing care, patients managing their own care, uh, we, we don't have access to because we're not telling, paying doctors to do what they need to do in order to make this inexpensive, cheap way of <coughs> delivering medical, medical care possible. <coughs> have any of you ever heard of Dr. Jeffrey Brenner? You know who he is. You know about hot spots. Yeah, okay. Uh, this was an article in New Yorker a year or so ago. Dr. Jeffrey Brenner is in Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey is one of the poorest places in the whole country, uh, we're told. Uh, everybody in Camden is either on Medicare or Medicaid or they're uninsured. There's almost no private insurance there. Uh, Brenner is an entrepreneur. He's a researcher. He's going down the hospital records and he discovered that 1% of all the people in Camden are spending 30% of the hospital's money. 1% okay? spend 30%. So Brenner picks out one of the worst of these patients and this is a guy who weighs 600 pounds and uh, he's a drug addict, he's an alcoholic, he's diabetic, and uh, this guy spends um, half the year in the hospital. And when he's not in the hospital, he's abusing himself. Uh, so Brenner takes this guy under his wing, he gets him an Alcoholics Anonymous, he gets him off drugs, he gets him off alcohol, he um, finds out he's religious, and gets him to go to church, he signs him up for some welfare programs, so he has a little bit of economic stability in his life, and uh, before long, uh, this patient is no longer going into the hospital. And therefore, his expenses, his health care expenses, are going down, down, down. So Brenner was so impressed by what he was able to do in this case that he set up a clinic, he got some funding for it. And he and his colleagues uh, began doing this with other patients that were really high-cost patients whose costs could really be brought down if uh, some time were spent changing the way they were living their lives. Uh, Brenner told me he could drive down the uh, streets of Camden, he could point to buildings and tell me how much the entire building is costing Medicare and Medicaid. Now, here's my question for you. Um, in return for all of the millions of dollars, and it is millions of dollars, that Brenner is saving uh, Medicare these days, doing things just like what I described, how much do you think Medicare gives Brenner? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Uh, and now for all the millions of dollars that he's saving Medicaid, how much do you think Medicaid gives Brenner? Zero again. And why is that? Because mainly what I'm describing to you is social work, right? I mean, what I described to you that he did, keep Brenner out of the hospital, but basically is social work. I mean, so, so Medicare doesn't even consider that health care, even though it's saving millions of dollars of health care of healthcare money. Um, and why is that? Because as you go down the list of 7,500 things that Medicare pays for, again, social work is, for all practical purposes, not on that list. Now, what I said at my blog was that um, we ought to allow Brenner to become a millionaire. Because we ought to say to Brenner, if you save, uh, if save taxpayers a dollar, we'll let you keep 25 cents or 20 cents or something. I remember making this argument to the Bush administration. 
Um, I went in there uh, toward the end of the Bush administration, and they uh, gathered around, and uh, that day there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about the Geisinger Health System in central Pennsylvania. And Geisinger, some of you may know, has a warranty on his, high, on his heart surgery. So if they screw up, the patient has to be readmitted. Uh, you don't pay a second time. And they do that for Medicare as well as the private players. And they were the first hospital in the country that did this. And what I said to the Bush people was, you know, you want to get on the telephone right now and you want to tell the folks at Geisinger, uh, we really like what you're doing. Warranties are valuable to us. You're saving us money, so we want to pay you something in return. So the people in the room looked at me in horror and they said, well, how, you know, why would we want to give away money? And I said, because what you want to do is you want to give Geisinger money and then tell every hospital in the country, every other hospital, what you have done. And invite every hospital hospital system to come to Medicare and propose a different way of being paid. And the rule should be, if you're going to save the taxpayer money, if you're going to improve quality for the patient, uh, and, uh, and you can prove you know, six months out or 12 months out that you have done these things, then we'll pay you in a different way. So instead of Washington telling the hospital how it's going to be paid, let the hospital tell Washington that there is a different way to pay them, and uh, as long as it's saving us money and improving care for the patients, we should be willing to do just that. Well, the Bush people thought that was the most radical thing they'd ever heard of, and uh, so they didn't buy my, uh, my idea. Little did they know how radical things were going to get with, with Obamacare. <coughs> In any event, we need to free the patient, we need to free the doctor, and the third thing we need to do is free the entrepreneur. I can't think of a single problem in healthcare right now that's not being solved in some way by an entrepreneur somewhere. But most of the really good entrepreneurial activity is outside of the third party payer system because it's the third party payers that are the bureaucracies that keep entrepreneurs from solving our problems. But if you go outside the third party payer system, and by that I mean if you find any healthcare market where Blue Cross isn't, where Medicare is and where the employers aren't, then you're going to find a market that works pretty well. And I mentioned earlier the men, the men in clinics and the other walk-in clinics, of which are about a thousand. Um, they post their prices. You walk into a normal doctor's office, you don't see prices posted for anything. In fact, you, you, you go to great difficulty finding out what the price of anything is. Uh, but in the men in clinic, they're posting, you know, exactly what you're going to pay. When patients spend their own money, providers compete on price. When they compete on price, you don't have to ask what the price is. They tell you what it's going to be. And I'll tell you something else. When they compete on price, they also compete on quality. The market for cosmetic surgery is another example where the third party payers are. Uh, looking around this room, I would guess that most of you don't know much about that market. <laughs> but uh, give another 10 years, you two will be going to care about it. In cosmetic surgery, you get a package price that covers uh, the total cost of the procedure. Uh, it covers the doctor, the nurse, the necessary the facility. Uh, you don't have to ask what the price is. You know what the price in advance is going to be. And uh, despite the fact that over the last 15 years we've had a huge increase in these procedures, huge increase in demand, like four, five, six-fold increase, we've had all kinds of technological change of the type that we're told increases costs for every other procedure. And yet the real price of cosmetic surgery keeps going down, even as the real price of every other kind of surgery keeps going up. Uh, LASIK surgery is another example. Over the last decade, again, huge increase in the number of procedures, all kinds of technological change. Uh, you have price competition, you have quality competition, and the real price of LASIK surgery has gone down by 25%. Rx.com uh, was the first online uh, mailhouse uh, for prescription drugs. It came into existence to compete with local pharmacies on price. When providers compete on price, they often compete on quality as well, so their error rate is lower than the error rate at your local pharmacy. And uh, they came into existence, why? Because there was a big market out there where people were spending their own money. If Blue Cross were buying all the drugs, there would be no Rx.com. If Blue Cross were, dry, were buying all the drugs, you would not see Walmart offering a 90-day supply uh, for $10. And you would not see Teladoc of Dallas, where there's two million people who now pay uh, one or two dollars a month for the right to consult with a doctor by telephone. So there are doctors who consult by telephone, but they're outside largely the third-party payer system. We do this for our employees, by the way. 
and it costs about $30 per consultation. They have electronic medical records. Uh, uh, we're, we're told that that's a huge problem. The Obama administration is pushing every doctor to have electronic medical records. Well, Teladoc's had them for 10 years. Many clinics have had them for 10 years. There's no problem with electronic medical records when they're developed on the supply side of the market by people who need them for a business reason. There is a problem when you have buyers of care trying to push the providers into doing something for which they see no business reason. Now the Obama approach to health care reform is very simple and President Obama has summed it up in one sentence which is repeated many times. You may not remember this, but Obama says in health care we need to find out what works and then go do it. Um, by which he means this, he means we're going to do pilot programs, we're going to do demonstration projects, we're going to see what we like and then we're going to copy it. And um, he says, by the way, the same thing about education. But the only difference is in education we've been trying to do exactly that for 25 years with no real success. In healthcare we're finding out that we're getting no real success either. We have paid for performance, demonstration projects, electronic medical records, coordinated care, integrated care, all these ideas that we're out there testing. The Congressional Budget Office has looked at all this three separate times and said each time this is not saving money and we can find very few cases where the results are even positive but even there they're so negligible that you can't expect much to happen as a result of it. What we're discovering is something that uh, all of you should have known anyway that when you have a bureaucratic system you tend to have a very mediocre system and then you have little pockets of excellence that spring up here and there and the pockets of excellence tend to be correlated with nothing because the pockets of excellence are there because of the enthusiasm, the leadership, the willpower of one or two individuals, not because of anything that's happening on the demand side of the market. In fact, both in education and healthcare, we tend to penalize uh, anybody who's really good and anyone who's really uh, producing more efficient, higher quality care. Not only do they not get more money, they do let, they get less money for doing what they're doing. Um, but you can find in the United States uh, and in other countries uh, many examples of high quality uh, medicine. These are the little pockets of excellence. But in every single case, I think what you're going to find is that the pocket of excellence came into existence because of something happening on the supply side of the market, never on the demand side of the market. You get the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and places like that because of the supply side, not because of the demand side. And that's what the Obama administration doesn't understand. If we want to solve our problems, we have to free, in addition to the patient, the doctor, the entrepreneurs, and they have to be free to repackage and reprice what they're going to offer to the market. And if you're trying to tell them what to do from Washington, then you're not going to solve any of these problems. Um, real quickly, let's talk about Obamacare. Um, in my opinion, um, even if there were no Republicans in Washington, even if there were no conservatives in Washington, the, the, all the people who voted for Obamacare are going to want to go in and seriously change it uh, before 2014. And part of the reason is there are six really, really big problems that are so major <coughs> that, um, that they're going to cause Obamacare to collapse of its own weight if somebody doesn't go in and change them. And the first is the mandate. What Obamacare does is it requires you to buy a health plan whose cost is going to be rising at twice the rate of growth of your income. Now, Obama didn't create this problem. Healthcare spending has been rising at twice the rate of growth of our income for the last four decades. And it's not just a U.S. problem. It's happening all over the developed world. And we're not the worst country, by the way. We're kind of in the middle of the real per capita healthcare spending uh, over the last 40 years. We're right about the middle of the OECD average. Um, so they didn't, Obama didn't create the problem, Congress didn't create the problem, but this is a path we can't continue on. So if we stay on this path, we're going to eventually uh, crowd out everything else. You don't need to be an accountant or an economist or even have a pocket calculator to know if you're buying something and its cost is growing at twice as fast as your income, eventually it's going to crowd out everything else <coughs> you're consuming. <coughs> If we stay on the path we are on, today's teenagers will reach a retirement age, they'll have nothing to eat, nothing to wear, no place to live, but they have lots and lots of health care. Presumably, <laughs> we don't want to do, go uh, reach that point. Um, but what Obamacare does is it locks us onto that path. 
and it takes away from you the sort of normal defenses you would have against an insurance premium that keeps rising uh, faster than you can afford. So what would you normally do? You would take scale down coverage or higher deductibles and do things like that. Well, the Obamacare really, really restricts your ability to do those things. So that's, that's an impossible uh, constraint. It will have to be changed. The second thing is a bizarre system of subsidies. Uh, the hotel across the street, uh, most of the people you see in the hotel are only making um, $15 an hour setting. Who are these people? These are the maids, the busboys, they are the waiters, the waitresses, the custodial people. Uh, $15 an hour is about $30,000 a year. Family coverage under Obamacare is going to cost about $30,000. That's about half their wage. And, uh, and the hotel is going to be required to provide uh, that, that, that benefit. Uh, there is no new subsidy in the legislation to help that hotel or those hotel employees. It's just going to be a requirement that you guys have to somehow come up with $15,000, which is half of what you're paying the employees right now. On the other hand, if the employees can manage to get over to a newly created health insurance exchange, then the subsidies are really generous. Uh, the government will end up paying 98% of the cost of the insurance. Now, um, at the high end, the incentives are the reverse. That is, if you have somebody at the hotel, let's say at the manager level, and he's making 100000 a year, he gets no subsidy in the exchange. But if the employer provides the insurance, he gets the subsidies that are in the tax law right now. And what are those subsidies? It's the ability of the employer to pay health insurance premiums with pre-tax dollars. Those $15 an hour workers are not paying income taxes. So if they avoid taxes, they're only going to avoid a payroll tax. But at the high end, that worker is going to avoid a 25% income tax, a 15% payroll tax. Uh, I don't know if Illinois has a state income tax you do, don't you? <laughs> you know, pretty high. Avoid that too. And as a result, for the higher income guy, the that kind of subsidy is equal to almost half the cost of the insurance. So you have high income employees, above average income employees, who are going to want to continue getting insurance from an employer because it's generously subsidized. Low income people would be better off if they can get to the exchange. So what's going to happen? Um, I'm not a uh, employee benefits uh, expert or, or labor law expert, but I am an economist, and the economist in me tells me that when you have incentives that are that strong, people are going to find a way. And it may be that uh, the hotel makes all the, the low-wage people part-time, or maybe makes them all contract, uh, or maybe it divides in two, and <coughs> one corporation employs the, the low-income <coughs> folks and doesn't provide health insurance, and the other employs the high-income folks and does. Um, but the problem for our economy is you don't want the structure of the economy all changing based on health insurance subsidies. Uh, you want it to respond to economic conditions so we remain competitive in the international marketplace. Um, once that begins to dawn on people, once it begins to dawn on Congress what they've really done, and by the way, they really don't know what they've done, uh, then I think it will be enormous pressure to change all of that. Number three, you have uh, a health insurance exchange in which insurers are going to have really, really perverse incentives. Um, all of you have seen the, uh, uh, the casualty insurance ads on TV. You see the, the black actor and the town behind him has been destroyed, and he says it only took two minutes to destroy this town. Uh, and then he says, You're, are you in good hands? And, um, and then you see all the Aflac ads. They're all focused on bad stuff happening, right? My favorite print ad is the Chubb ad or the guy's going with a canoe over the back of Niagara Falls and the tagline is, you know, who your insurer is doesn't matter till it matters. <laughs> um, now what is the message here? The message of all the uh, all these um, uh, casualty insurance ads is we know you don't care about insurance until something bad happens and when the bad thing happens then we're going to be there for you. Now what happens in health insurance is exactly the opposite. And where you see this, where it's most visible, is you probably don't see many health insurance ads at all. But in Washington, D.C., at the end of the year, it's open season time for federal employees, and they see a lot of ads. And they see them on TV, and they see them in The Hill, and Politico, and other places where, where federal employees are, or that where they look, what they read. And these ads uh, don't focus on what can go wrong. They never mention AIDS, or cancer, or heart disease. Instead, they show pictures of young, healthy families. And the implicit 
message is if you look like the folks in this photo, then we want you, and if you don't, we may not want you. The problem with health insurance is, again, we have totally suppressed the marketplace. We do not allow the price to reflect the cost that the individual brings to the, to the system. So for federal employees, it's the same price for all, no matter how old you are or how young or how sick or how well. And so what do the insurers do? They try to attract the healthy and avoid the sick. But their perverse incentives don't stop at the point of enrollment. They continue on. So their incentives, once you're in the plan, are to overprovide to the healthy because they want to keep the ones they have and attract more of them, underprovide to the sick because they don't really want the ones they have and they certainly don't want to attract any more of them. And those are the kind of perverse incentives you don't want your health plan to have. And um, what happens now, if you want to know why the federal plan isn't worse than it is, or the outcome isn't worse, is because the OPM, uh, which is the Federal Government's Office of Personnel Management, operates like a big HR department. And it can sort of rides hurt on this. But take those guys away, open up the system to everybody in Washington, D.C., and you would have a big mess. And that's what's, what's about to happen. When you're, people forget that their employer and their insurance broker are their protector and defender in this bureaucratic system. You take away the protectors and the defenders, and you create terrible incentives for them on the supply side, and, and we're all in trouble, or at least you'll be in trouble if you have a health problem. And um, that's not what I think we want to do. And then over on the buyer side, uh, we're going to make it really easy for people to stay uninsured while they're healthy, wait till they get sick, buy the insurance, get their care, get their bills paid, and then drop the insurance again. In Massachusetts, they call these jumpers and dumpers. You jump in after you get sick, you dump the plan after your bills are paid. Um, you know, we went all the way to the Supreme Court on this whole issue of a mandate, but the fact is, it's going to be a weekly enforced mandate, and the penalty is not very high anyway. And the IRS isn't going to be able to do much to you if you don't pay the fine. It can't, can't garnish your wages. It can't, can't do all the normal things that it would do if you didn't pay other taxes. So people will have very, very strong incentives to gain the system. And if they do that in large numbers, then, uh, then the price of insurance will go up rapidly because only healthy, you know, only sick people, I'm sorry, will be in the pool. Uh, fifth problem is the problem for safety net institutions. This, um, and by the way, the reason you don't know, or if you don't know, why you don't know a lot of things I'm saying to you is because the media is not reporting any of it. And the mainstream media isn't reporting it because they rely on health reporters, and health reporters are not reporting anything bad about <coughs> the health law. <coughs> All you're hearing about is 26-year-olds getting covered. My gosh, 26-year-olds are the healthiest people in our country. <laughs> if you want to solve problems, they're the last people you should be talking about. Uh, they're talking about free checkups for seniors. Uh, well, you know, every study I've ever seen says that free, the, you know, checkups for well people is basically a waste of money. Okay, so they keep talking about the trivial stuff and ignoring the really big stuff. Um, fifth problem, our safety net institutions, we have way over promised here. Uh, if the projections are right, we're going to insure about 32 million new people. All the rest of you are going to have to have coverage more generous than the coverage that you now have. You're going to have to have a whole long list of preventive services with no deductible, no co-payment. Um, and so what I'm describing to you is a huge increase in demand, but no change in supply. And this is what happened in Massachusetts. Uh, Romney's right. I mean, they cut the number of uninsured in half, but they didn't create any new doctors. Um, when I was testifying the other day, the, I think I really shocked a lot of the Democratic members of the committee I was testifying to when I told them that there's no more, there's no new care being delivered in Massachusetts. There are no new doctors, no new nurses, no new clinics. You can say we've cut the uninsurance rate in half, that's true, but they're not delivering more care. And basically people are going to the same place as they went before. I remember Governor Romney telling me on the phone several years ago, uh, once we get this thing in place, uh, people won't go to the emergency room. They'll go to the doctor's office where there's lower costs, more appropriate. But the problem is there are not more doctor's offices. So we've got more people going to emergency rooms today in Massachusetts than ever before. Uh, basically, people are going to the same place they went before, the community health centers, the emergency rooms. 
All that's happened in Massachusetts is we just shuffle money around. But in a place like Texas, uh, where one out of every four persons is now uninsured, uh, we're going to have a huge problem with our safety net institutions. Half the uninsured are going to Medicaid. Medicaid patients tend to use the hospital emergency room disproportionately, and, um, and that's going to put a huge strain on our system. Um, what's going to happen in a world in which there's a huge rationing problem and doctors don't have to take every patient that's knocking on their door? Well, they're going to take the patient first that pays the most, right? In fact, they're already doing this in dermatology. The New York Times went out and did this study. It was fascinating. Um, when the patient's called in with a problem that Medicaid, Medicare pays for, they got an answering machine and they had a several week wait and uh, they went to emergency room, they, sorry, they went to a waiting room that was sort of spartan and uh, not very comfortable. But if they called in with a Botox problem or something that Medicare didn't pay for, then they, there was a separate phone number, and they got a live person on the phone. They got in right that day or the next day, and they got a much nicer waiting room. So there's two-tier medicines already started, and we don't really have Obamacare really underway. Um, now, in this kind of world, you do not want to be in a plan that pays below market. And who is in a plan that pays below market? Well, it's the seniors and disabled on Medicare. It's poor people on Medicaid. <coughs> And if Massachusetts is the example, it will be people in the newly subsidized health plans. Um, now, this is going to be a great time to start thinking about a concierge doctor. Any of you have one? More of you will start thinking about this in about a year and a half's time, especially if you're of Medicare age. Um, what does a concierge doctor do for about $1,500 a year in most places? They provide you with same-day service or next-day service. They're your agent in the system. Uh, they uh, typically have electronic medical records. They talk to you by phone. They talk to you by email. Uh, basically, the $1,500 is the fee you're going to pay to not have your health care rationed by waiting. Uh, last problem that I think is going to be so huge that um, the Congress is going to want to do something is the problem for the seniors. And I've partly talked about it already, but uh, but what makes it even worse is that more than half of the cost of Obamacare is paid for by gutting Medicare. So taking $500 billion the first 10 years out of Medicare, and they're using that money to create a new entitlement for young people. And, um, and what does this mean? Well, the chief actuary has told us what this means. It means that uh, before the decade is out, one out of seven hospitals is just going to have to leave the system. The seniors are going to have increasing difficulty finding doctors who will see them. And um, it's so severe that nobody inside the Washington Beltway who's looked at this carefully thinks this will ever happen. So the Congressional Budget Office is putting out an alternative forecast. Says, here's, here's what the law says, and here's an alternative forecast we think you really ought to look at. And the actuaries at Medicare have gone beyond that. They've actually put the alternative forecast inside the trustees' report, which is unheard of. Now, this is Washington's bureaucratic way of saying we don't believe that Congress will ever do uh, what they have legislated. And so we want to draw to everyone's attention that there's going to be enormous pressure to undo it. Well, undo it means that we haven't paid for the bill. And so if we haven't paid for the bill, that means that we're going to have higher and higher deficits because of the spending. And so one way or the other, we've got real, real problems on the horizon. One last thing, and then we'll open it up. Um, we think it's important to have an alternative to Obamacare. Uh, I went to Washington a few weeks ago and presented a health contract with America to the Republican doctors. They put it up at their website by the House Republican doctors, I should say. And um, basically, real quickly, it's um, Number one, tax fairness, that instead of the wildly different tax subsidies we have under the current system, and even more wildly different that we're going to have under Obamacare, we treat everybody the same. I think we could have a tax credit of $2,500 for an adult, $8,000 for a family of four. Everybody gets the same amount of money. So if you're a family, uh, typical employer plan might cost $16,000. First $8,000 is paid for with your tax credit. The next 8000 if you want it all, it comes out of your pocket and your employer's pocket, but those are after-tax dollars. Those are unsubsidized dollars. 
And then to get universality, uh, if you turn down the credit, then we should send the money to a safety net institution in the area where you live so that if you need care and you can't pay for it, their money is there as a, back, as a backstop. So money follows people, a certain amount of money goes wherever you go, people go to insurance, it goes to the insurance company, people don't, it goes to the safety net. I've been criticized by uh, uh, some folks uh, who think this isn't libertarian enough, but this is about as minimal as you can get government. If government's already in the system and you're not going to get it completely out, well, the way to minimize it is, to, is just this way, same number of dollars for everybody and then no mandate, let the market work. Just like I'll let you ask a question. Uh, number three, uh, we need a, a generous health savings account uh, because we need to encourage people to manage their own care. If they're going to do that, they need to manage the money that pays for that care. We need portability. Many of you may not know this, but it's against the law in Illinois for the Heartland Institute to buy Blue Cross individual insurance for its employees. That's illegal. <laughs> it has to buy group insurance, which means when they leave here, they have to lose their insurance if they go someplace else. So we ought to turn that around. <laughs> Employers should be encouraged to buy portable insurance for their employees that goes from job to job and in and out of the labor market. Uh, I think this, in fact, I know that these ideas would be politically very popular if you can just find some guys who want to want to run on these ideas. Um, but uh, and finally, we need real insurance, and this is something that only the only only in this book, only at the NCPA, are we talking about this. Health insurance needs to be real insurance. Um, we need to be able to insure against a pre-existing condition. That, that's basically what you do when you buy life insurance. You buy life insurance when you're healthy, then let's say you have a prostate cancer test, the, the results are bad, now what happens? Well, you, your premium doesn't go up, you don't get kicked out of the plan. Uh, if cancer kills you, then your, your heirs get paid off, right? Um, health insurance can work the same way. And if you have to switch plans, then the plan you were in, the plan you've been paying premiums to, should pay the higher premium if you have to go to another plan because you developed a health condition. Uh, this is called change of health status insurance, and actually it was first proposed by John Cochran, who's right here in this city at the University of Chicago, and um, and we think that's that's the kind of insurance that ought to be available. So if insurance were portable, and if you could buy that kind of health insurance, we would never have a problem with pre-existing conditions. Okay. Even if, as it is, uh, right now under Obamacare, anyone with a pre-existing condition who's denied coverage in the private insurance market can go buy insurance in a risk pool for the same price healthy people are paid, and we know how many of them there are. There are 62,000. So we're going to spend a trillion dollars over the next six years all to address a problem that 62,000 people have. Uh, all right. I promise that if I, uh, or I promise the Heartland folks, if I said as many controversial things I thought I might say, <laughs> that I would stop and let you all have that many. <laughs> yes, sir. If they just gave an $8,000 or $16,000 subsidy to each family, why wouldn't the health insurance company just raise everybody's rates by eight, eight or $16,000? Well, the health insurance companies could do whatever they want to, but right now for family coverage, a typical employer is paying twice that, it's paying 16. So people would then have to decide, well, am I, do I really value that last $8,000? Or could I take, you know, something that costs less than that? I think very quickly you, it would be the reverse of what you're suggesting. You would find policies that are only 8,000, providing good benefits almost as good as the 16. But to get the price down to eight thousand, uh, you're not going to be able to go to any hospital in Chicago. You're not going to be able to see any doctor in Chicago. You probably would be able to see a very high quality doctor and go to a very high quality hospital. Um, but um, but your insurer wouldn't be able to pay for anything the market just happened to have out there. Yes. Uh, you have an opportunity to spend time with uh, the actual politicians who are writing the laws. And I'm wondering, as you go through the list of things that would cause even the Democrats, even the Democrats, uh, to repeal this absent uh, conservative voices or want to change it, those were all really good economic reasons why they'd want to. So as you talk to these people, how much about what they're doing 
has anything to do with health care and economics and more to do with simply wanting to have control over the system because that would be immune to those considerations that you raise that are pretty good common sense economic reasons to, to not want to go through with it. Well, I find that on both sides of the aisle, people do not understand health care and they do not know what this legislation does. And it's, it's rather amazing how little thought they've given to it. But I, I decided a long time ago um, that members of Congress only need to know as much as their constituents know. And that's really all they respond to. And what's going to cause the law to change is when the seniors get on the phone and say, I can't find a doctor who will see me. You do something about it. Then they're going to want to do something about it. And, um, and it, when the safety net hospitals say, we, we, we're broke, we don't have enough money, they're going to want to do something about that. And um, when the employer says, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to lay off people because we can't afford this, they will respond to their constituents. Uh, along those lines, I mean, isn't it just a matter of time? Um, again, Obamacare is about power. It's not about health care. It's not even about insurance. It's about control over people's lives. And you mentioned how with Obamacare, more doctors are going to stop taking Medicaid, stop taking, you know, stop taking Medicare patients. Isn't it inevitable that the federal government will just insist or mandate that a doctor can't reject uh, people on Medicaid or Medicare? Or maybe states um, issue licenses, contingents on, we don't give you a license to practice medicine unless you... Uh, take the patients we tell you to take at the prices we tell you to take them at. Everybody hear that? Um, <laughs> most countries in the world today have, have an outlet. Um, uh, Canada uh, is one of the very few exceptions. Uh, but in most countries, there's a way to get outside the system if you've got money or you've got power. And um, if you like, the politicians leave themselves away off for their own health care. <laughs> Um, but they also leave out, uh, leave, leave a way out for other wealthy and powerful people. So I don't expect that they will close all the doors. Uh, in fact, in Canada, the doors are opening. The Canadian system is coming apart. Yes. I just started reading your book. I had always thought that medical tourism would be the answer that woke everyone up, and then I was intrigued to read that you felt that there was medical tourism right in this country, like Medicare. There is medical tourism in this country, and nobody knows about it. But the Canadians know about it because they're coming down here and they're getting knee replacements and hip replacements, and they're paying half what you and I pay. And um, they're able to do it because they're willing to travel, they're willing to pay cash. And if you're willing to do that, then hospitals will deal with you, at least many of them will. Um, but I also said in the book that you and I can participate in the same market, provided we're willing to do what the Canadians do. Now, the hospital next door is not going to deal with you because they think they'll get your business anyway. So, the, so they'll, they'll continue with their current way of doing it, just saying, you come in our hospital, we can't tell you in advance what anything will cost. But if you're willing to get on a plane and you're willing to pay cash, you can cut in half the cost of your knee replacement or your hip, hip replacement. And that's the domestic market for medical tourism, and I think, think that will grow. And this is one of the ways that you can cut the cost of a typical employer plan in half, is by only dealing with institutions that are high quality and will, will set a price in advance. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, two things. First of all, I love the uh, minute clinics. I don't want to wait around for an appointment, so you know, I go to that for any, anything. They're amazing. But on a separate note, I'm a hospice volunteer, and um, I was asking why they couldn't email, uh, I couldn't email my reports, my patient visit reports, and they could email me information so that then we, you know, be more efficient. And part of uh, what the comment was is that the HIPAA uh, legislation uh, would, would be, uh, it would be a violation of HIPAA legislation if they emailed patient name and information to me and I mailed my patient reports to them. Uh, the other thing that I noticed as a, a volunteer, and I go into homes and nurse, people's homes and nursing homes and hospitals, uh, is the triple and quadruple uh, paper 
betrayal, all because of the fear of being sued. And I'm wondering if in your book, which I have not read, if there is any uh, kind of cost percentage uh, as a result of the potential lawsuits in terms of the health cost in attacking it, or again in the Obama legislation, if there is anything in terms of lawsuit caps, etc. There's nothing in Obamacare which deals with malpractice reform. Uh, there is in my book. And I'm more radical than probably anybody you've talked to about malpractice reform. I would like to get the lawyers completely out. And the way you do that is you allow liability by contract. So the legislature sets a minimum standard. And uh, if you go in the hospital, then you're told in advance, you, you waive your right to sue. And in return, you're told that if, if you something bad happens to you, an adverse medical outcome that's unrelated to the reason why you came in the hospital, infection, whatever, um, they screw up, whatever, whether they're at fault or not at fault, then you get paid a certain amount of money your heirs do, and, you're, um, uh, and you know in advance what that sum is going to be. And so it's kind of like uh, workers' comp. You know, there's a schedule of things that go wrong, and there's a schedule of payments, and you know. Now, an insurance company is going to have to pay off these claims, and so it'll be episodic uh, uh, insurance. So for each, each patient, there's, you know, will be covered. And the insurance company then charge the hospital based on what it's doing. And hospitals now can, under what I'm describing, can make money by getting their error rate down. But, and this is very important, um, they need to get down their adverse events regardless of why they occur. It doesn't matter whether it's malpractice or whether it's preventable or whether it's an act of God. It doesn't matter what category. If they find a way to reduce them, they get just as much money in each case. And so we get away from the whole notion of who was at fault to the notion of how do you improve safety. Yeah. At the end you said we need to get health insurance back to being real insurance. It seemed like during the um, push for Obamacare that the insurance companies, which are full of actuaries and economists and things, they were pushing toward Obamacare. It seemed like they were kind of voting for something that was going to result in the demise of their own business. Can you explain that? Well, you know, you have to understand that every special interest sold out, the doctors, the hospitals, the drug companies, the health insurance companies, every single one of them cooperated with and every single one of them is now getting screwed. Uh, even ARP, supposed to be representing seniors, they sold out. Um, and here Medicare is being gutted. So I can't think of a single group that didn't go along with this to the detriment of their own members. Why did they do that? Because they get, Washington's a place where they tell you, in the first place, Obama the Obama administration has a reputation of being very vindictive and um, to begin with. And then they tell you, if you don't come to the table, you're going to be the lunch. And so they threaten you. And, um, and so all these people cooperate, and it's just the atmosphere of Washington. Um, really hard for out, uh, people outside the Beltway to understand. Yeah. So I I need like an easier argument when I'm talking to people about the health care, because all this makes sense, economic sense, just like education and everything. So I talked to my cab driver on the way here. I said, what do you think? Uh, he goes, well, we're all getting free health care. I said, where's the money coming from? Government. It's Obama money. It's free. This is great. Why would you not want free health care? And I couldn't argue with him. It sounded good to me. I almost was ready to vote for Obama myself. <laughs> but it's free. And, and maybe we'll get some other free stuff. So how do you, how do you argue this? And I know they're wrong. But people think it's free, and, and you can't convince them. Well, you know, I usually don't get involved in that because basically what I'm advocating is also going to make free money available to people. We already have the whole Medicaid system, and we're, we're not going to get rid of it. And so basically what I'm proposing to you is the federal government set a dollar figure on each of us. You get $2,500, and that's all you get. And that's a refundable tax credit. And it doesn't matter how much money you or earning or what taxes you owe or don't owe, it, it's refundable. You get it, provided you buy insurance with it. So I'm making that concession. But half the people aren't paying taxes, so a tax credit means nothing to half the people. It's refundable. Even if they pay no taxes, they still get the money, if they buy the insurance. Right? 
And so I'm, I'm conceding that government will have that minimal role. I don't think we can get away from it. <laughs> the ideal for me would be a complete separation of health care and state. But I don't think we can get there. So if we can't get there, let's treat everybody the same. Um, and, uh, and that's what I'm proposing. And, and forget Medicaid, and forget you know, the health insurance exchanges, and forget all of that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thrilled to have you here and meet you. I actually read your 673-page book 20 years ago and bought probably 40, 50 copies of the little pamphlet and handed them out to people. And I don't know how much progress we're making, but uh, I've been following you for years. But I've, I've read most of your book, and I, I had this aha that you uh, you make the point that we, we have these programs supposedly for the poor, but they end up being for lots of people. And I, I don't know if you mentioned earlier, I was a little late coming in, but Medicare Part D, only 7% of the money went to new prescriptions. That's right. 93% was to cover things people were already paying for another way. And the other aha was that, again, we try to help the poor, but we built these second-class infrastructures. You know, we've got Medicaid and, and county health clinics and so on that are clearly you know, not as good as, as people with money have access to. We've done it in health care. We tried that in housing. It didn't work out too well. Um, we now have subsidies for housing instead of building government housing. That seems to work better. Uh, schools, you know, we can debate how well that's working. But we've, the aha was we've never done that with food. Food stamps, too many people on food stamps because of Obama's policies. But the food stamp program actually works pretty well because they go to the same stores and buy the same products we do, and they can add their own money to it. That was a real aha to me. Good. Uh, since you mentioned the earlier book, it was called Patient Power. And that was the book that introduced health savings accounts to the country. And uh, it was a very impactful book because now there are 24 million families that are managing some of their own health care dollars. And that's the fastest growing product in the insurance market right now. Obama, if he goes forward with what they're doing, the way they're doing it, they're going to wipe health, and health savings accounts out of the individual market. So we really do have an important election coming up. <laughs> Two very, very different The other philosophies. point you make about HSAs is the fact that between that and employers start to have people pay a little more, that that's the only reason there's been innovation in delivery, whether it's minute clinics or online prescriptions or whatever. It's because there's at least some modicum of money that patients control and can be competed for. That's right. So to free up the supply side, you have to start with the demand side. Yeah. John, I can't even begin to say I understand what's going on. But one thing that I fall back on is you've got the insurance companies who are experts in their field. And you've got the AMA that are experts in their field. And they all know that they have a problem. Why couldn't they get together? Why couldn't it be legislated by the government that you get together and resolve this problem? To your satisfaction in the best interest of the patients out there instead of the government getting involved and even making it a worse mess. One thing I should have said earlier is that most of these special interests are getting some special money from the government. The AMA gets more money from the sale of, of its payment codes. Then they the, deserve what they get. They get then they get from dues. They absolutely deserve what they get. Okay. The, Health insurance companies, um, they are managing all the Medicare Advantage plans. I mean, they're, they're uh, Blue Cross manages Medicare. Everybody thinks Medicare is a yeah. public program. Yeah. Blue Cross is managing it. The, uh, the hospitals, all these groups are getting something from the government. John, I, I was on a board of a hospital for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, and they, I have to say the worst administrators in business are at hospitals. <laughs> Not only that, but in, in the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith said that Everybody acting in their own best interest will benefit society, except at a hospital. <laughs> because, because these doctors will cut their nose to spite their face for a buck. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. They had a coup at this hospital to get rid of the president and, and, the, and the vice president. And the doctor that was proposing it was doing something in his own best interest to shoot it down. Okay. Yes. So, John, you said this 
election is really, really important. Is it really on the health care issue? I mean, Romney care, Obamacare, one and the same. Are we just, no. Is Romney really going to do something different if he gets elected? Yes, I think he will, and I think that, that, that the Republicans are committed to seriously dismantling Obamacare. There's no way that they can be credible and not do it. I mean, they, they are, they've made that the number one issue. And remember in the House, they voted, what, 31 times to either completely dismantle or partially dismantle the program. There's no way they can go back and not do it. Um, so my worry is that they are refuse to focus on the alternatives. Because just getting rid of Obamacare doesn't get rid of the problem. We still are left with a hugely bureaucratic system where, we, where no one sees real market prices. And I'm having real trouble getting uh, the Republicans to, to focus on alternatives. They, 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 put the how, they put my contract up at their doctor's site, but that's not the same as saying we're going to run on this and you elect us and we're going to go do it. Yeah. Sorry to ask a second question, but I, I, you can make sense of this for us. The Supreme Court ruling that sort of cut out the state and the Medicaid piece from this, it seems hard to get to find a coherent article over just exactly what that means. Is it because nobody really knows yet, but how convoluted does that make this? If the law doesn't change at all, if it's not repealed, but that piece stands, how much mischief can the states make and how much trouble would it cause if 26 states say we're not going to play, 24 are left to play, but 26 don't, what happens? It's a big mess. So let me just do this real quickly. Uh, between 100 and 133 percent, but since they're ignoring 5 percent of income, it's really 138 percent. From 100 percent of poverty to 138 percent of poverty, they were supposed to go into Medicaid. Why? because in Congress they couldn't afford for these people private insurance. Now the Supreme Court says that they don't have to go into Medicaid, so now what can they do? They can go over to the exchange where they only have to pay 2% of their income uh, and they get this very generous health insurance. What the state of Illinois can do is it can actually pay the 2%, which isn't very much, just to ensure that they get the private insurance. And still, they'll be better off than Medicaid. So, so every state ought to not cover these people for, uh, for, for Medicaid. Let them go to the exchange. Now, strangely, below 100%, uh, they can't go into the exchange. And so if the state doesn't expand, we've got a whole group of people here who are just in limbo. They can't get into Medicaid, they can't get into exchange, um, and they're, they're among the poorest people. Uh, very, very strange. Now, what I think, though, might work is there are five Republican governors who said, well, look, if you give us a block grant, just give us this money as a block grant, we don't have to match it and take the shackles off of us, but we'll cover this population, we'll at least offer this population. That's what Illinois should do. Um, get, get, because Rhode Island was the one state that got to do this under Bush, and Rhode Island lowered their costs, expanded their coverage, improved their quality, and so we have at least a precedent <laughs> that with less regulation, the states can do a better job. But it is one big mess. Okay, so there's time to sign books. So we'll call that a wrap. <laughs>
I got a call on a fish. I'm going to send you a bank with Jeff. I mentioned yesterday that not to stop everything, but not to stop everything. That's not our mind. Uh-uh, there's the bathroom. I was going to say, I see the red light on. 